Join me as we explore her remarkable life, her steadfast devotions, and the miraculous healings many have experienced here, including Rita Rizzo, the future Mother Angelica. Discover this wife, mother, convert, and stigmatist in an EWTN event, Wednesday, July 6th. The miracle hunter, Michael O'Neill, joins Father Mitch Pacwa for a special episode of EWTN Live. First, learn about Rhoda Wise's faith journey. Then stay tuned for the EWTN premiere of They Might Be Saints, Rhoda Wise. It all starts Wednesday, July 6th at 8 p.m. Eastern here on EWTN. Welcome to EWTN's ongoing coverage of the 10th World Meeting of Families taking place right here in Rome. I'm Catherine Hadro coming to you from St. Peter's Square and I'm joined by my two co-hosts. Dr. Matthew Bunsen is the executive editor in Washington, D.C. Bureau Chief of EWTN News, and Father Thomas Petrie is the president of the Dominican House of Studies. As you can hear the beautiful choir behind us, we are preparing now for the Papal Mass and ahead of time in this lead up, Pope Francis is in the Pope Mobile greeting the crowd here. The Holy Father, as is the Papal custom in the Pope Mobile, uh, doing a circuit around the crowd so that everyone really has a chance to see him. We'll have to see how far up he goes, the Via della Conciliazione. Uh, but certain, this is a great opportunity for those who want to see the Holy Father, especially since um, it's still a little open question as to whether or not he'll be actually the main celebrant tonight. Right. Right, absolutely. And would you say this is really the main event of the World's Meeting of Families that we're preparing for right now? I think absolutely. I mean, it all comes down to this, to the uh, leads up to this, I think is a yes. better way to say that, to the Mass with our with the Holy Father. Um, he, we're going to hear a wonderful homily, I'm sure, from him uh, this evening. It's been a wonderful few days here at the World Meeting of Families. I've been very edified. I know I've said this a number of times now, just how rich... Um, the talks have been, how theologically rich, but also experientially rich and, and very pastoral. Uh, here, I think, in this world meeting of families, we've seen the Holy Father's real agenda to families and to fa and the messiness that often accompanies families, all of our families. Absolutely. You know, this world meeting of families we knew was going to look different. Typically, it's the largest gathering of Catholic families. This one was much more scaled back. Invitation only 2,000 families. I, I think something we've heard from our guests who were in attendance here is that it was much more kind of professional. There was a, a very focused message each and every single day. Yeah, instead of having it at a massive expo that we've seen elsewhere, I think of Philadelphia, where you and I both uh, right. were helping with the coverage, uh, to Dublin, which was sprawling through Dublin. Uh, this is limited in many ways to this square yes. tonight, but also to what's called the Aula, or the, the Paul VI Hall here mm -hmm. in Vatican City State, which seats a, a good sized crowd, but, but about 2,000 attendees, 2,000 families, what that works out to in terms of numbers is another thing. Right. So it was very tightly focused, a reflection of COVID, but also in some ways a reflection of Pope Francis's more intense style. Absolutely, and the theme for this world meeting of families was family love, a vocation, and a path to holiness. Father, you started speaking to this, but I wanted to ask both of you, what have your main takeaways been so far from well this i think my main takeaways have been just that the church's teaching on marriage is alive and well and throughout the world we have a lot of issues with marriage and questions about different kinds of marriage in the west in the united states uh, those same issues aren't shared by every other catholic and every other culture there a lot of people are just trying to live as jesus christ calls us to live and as the church calls us to live. Absolutely. You can see on the screen Pope Francis going around um, to the audience here in St. Peter's Square ahead of the evening mass, the papal mass. Uh, Matthew, you mentioned earlier how the one speech we've heard from Pope Francis so far at the Festival of Families, he was talking about how the church is a field hospital. Yes. hospital. And he, he really is close to the flock, and we can see that right now. Yeah, and, and that, uh, the idea of the field hospital is played out in all of these, uh, the, the conferences and then the panels. But uh, one thing, too, that an event like this always drives home, and this was, I think, at the heart of what John Paul II, mm -hmm. St. John Paul yeah. II, the Great, was trying to achieve with the World Meeting of Families in, in a very similar way with the World Youth Days that he also established, and that is to bring families 
from all over the world to allow other families here and those who are viewing us right now to see the witness, to see the stories of other families from across the globe and, and to realize first that the problems you have aren't necessarily always the same, but there are a lot of very similar things. Why? Because we're part of humanity. Yes. Families are families. That's it. That's it. Father was mentioning his takeaways. Matthew, what have been your your main takeaway? Yeah, I think that's, for me, a, a beautiful reminder of the universality of the church, yeah. uh, the extent of the problems that families face all over the globe. Right. Uh, we've heard witnesses of infidelity and, and problems of the, di of the digital age yes. and uh, marriage to unbelievers. But there's also a very straight line through all of it. Uh, and the great line that we heard, I think just yesterday, is if you are not prepared to dive into doctrine, <laughs> doctrine and the sacraments, yes. you, will, you will find that the tides of life are insurmountable. A reoccurring theme seemed to be, yes, this acknowledgement that every family is messy. I feel like that's a, a kind of a great descriptor um, for a lot of the witnesses that we've heard. There's hardships, there is suffering, and yet this call to still say yes to marriage, still say yes to, to married life, and, and do not be afraid of that. And to say yes daily, to say okay. yes daily through the struggles and to always, you know, to say yes to the prayer, to say yes to the sacraments, to say yes to the grace of Christ, the only thing that will really pull you through some of the hardest times that every family faces. Absolutely. This papal mass that we're preparing for has actually been delayed um, from the original schedule over an hour, keeping in mind the sweltering heat here in Rome. You know, we're, we're here. It's still very, um, very much warm temperatures, and the, but the crowd is still filling out at St. Peter's Square here. Which is typical. It's June in Rome. Right. Uh, a lot of people are already planning vacations. Events in July and especially August tend yes. to be very scarce here. The city empties out with, yes. with good reason. We're, we, we felt it this week in, in terms of the heat. But Pope Francis uh, is somebody who does not go to Castel Gandolfo. Mm -hmm. He does staycations. That's so, well said. It's one of those little points that he likes to make that uh, he doesn't feel the need to leave the city, but he'll continue to work a bit during his, his vacations. But people come here to see St. Peter's. They come as pilgrims, and we're seeing a lot of those. We're seeing as well those in attendance here who want to hear those concluding words from Pope Francis. To set the table a little bit, we're also going to hear, in all likelihood, uh, a message from Cardinal Kevin Farrell, who yes. helped open the the world meeting of families, as well as uh, probably a mandate tonight from Pope Francis that will be reiterated tomorrow. We'll get some teases, I expect, as to what lies ahead for the world meeting of family in, in the coming years. All of this is bringing it to an end, but now the work starts of, of going back home. This theme of message has been throughout the world meeting of families as well. Uh, uh, the, of mission, rather. This, yes, this yeah, theme the theme of, of mission, mission, you know, that family the family needs to have a mission yes. not just internally which yes. is you know the procreation education of children but externally they involved in the parishes involved in volunteering involved in bringing Christ to the world I mean this is not just the conciliar Vatican II message this is the message of the church at least for the last 130 40 years that the lay faithful not only are called to holiness but are called in fact to transform the world Pope John Paul II in 1985 convoked here uh, a special synod of bishops and its function was to help give a, a, a really correct interpretation of the Second Vatican Council. The World Meeting of Families uh, that was implemented then about a decade later in 1994 right. is part of that effort of the Second Vatican Council stressing the role of the laity. As we've said, nothing new, realistically, but really focusing it more in terms of the, the place of the lady and the role that lady can have. He added into that then the role of families. And so we're seeing this fidelity and there's a continuity yes. in this long, beautiful tradition of the world meeting of families that's taking place here. We can see on the screen now Pope Francis there among the faithful flock here in St. Peter's Square. What do you think this moment means to families who are seeing Pope Francis up close and personal? I mean, seeing the it Holy looks like Father. He has some children riding with him in the right? Pope Mobile. Yes, so, yes, uh, we can he's see done that. this before. You know, yes. 
I don't know where they, where he picks up the children and how they get them back, but uh, <laughs> he, he loves having the children with him in the Pope Mobile. I, I think something we've seen with Pope Francis, and, and Matthew, tell me your thoughts on this as well, he always seems the most comfortable with the faithful, you know? He does, yeah. You know, not necessarily all the ceremony and, and all of that, but rather just when he's a pastor with the well, people. Well, he said it so often uh, that uh, you're always at risk of something becoming a cliche or an internet meme, mm -hmm. but with Francis, he's actually meant it, that he wants shepherds who have the smell of the sheep. Yes. So here is the shepherd out with the sheep, so to speak. Yes. He is with his flock, and... That's a, a theme that he's come back to. You, you see the, the theme that, on his own pectoral cross uh, of the good shepherd carrying the lost sheep. That's central to Francis's mission of mercy, of going out to the peripheries, of having that smell of the sheep. Yes. Well, as you mentioned, Matthew, these talks and conferences have been taking place in Paul the Sixth Hall here at the Vatican. We have a report to you to take you there to get an inside look at the Paul the Sixth Hall here at the World's Meeting of Families. We're here at the 10th World Meeting of Families in Rome, right outside Paul VI Hall, where all the conferences take place, where families hear lectures, but also testimonies and share their experiences about life and faith and family life. Let's have a look together. How do you like it here at the World Meeting of Families? It's an amazing experience. We've been here now for five days, I think. Uh, it's a little bit hot, but it's really nice. The Romans are very kind to us. What will those families take back from the World Meeting of Families to Burundi? What will they have learned? Love, uh, pardon, yes, reconciliation, but uh, also to accept the challenges in the family. It is uh, normal. Right now there's a break, so the families are out for a couple of minutes. We'll still try to interview a few people. So this is the right way to come to a world meeting of families with two strollers. That's very impressive. What's your name? Brian Tran. Hannah Tran. Hannah Tran. Where are you from? Australia. How was it so far at the world meeting of families? Oh, amazing. I got inspired a lot from the Abdullah family today, where forgiveness, love, and also faith, grow a family in faith. Like my wife, the Abdullah family, who are part of our delegation, have really uh, blown us away. And I think the rest of the people here as well have been uh, so blessed by their story, the story of forgiveness and redemption. Hi, sorry, could I ask you a few questions in English? Sure. Okay, what's your name? I'm Sydney. I'm Catherine. Where are you from? Um, we are representative of Iceland, Reykjavik. Of Iceland, so wow! So you came all the way from Iceland to Rome. How are you finding the World Meeting of Families? I'm, I really like it. I'm very amazed. The most inspiring are actually the testimonies because most of the times you think, with all your doubts and your fears about being modern-day Catholic, that it's hard to live and you're all by yourself. You feel this sense of community. That last story was really beautiful and touching. People are yearning for forgiveness. What that family had to go through. Lost their kids and really had to learn to forgive the person who killed the kids and just learn to forgive themselves. I think that is that's just a beautiful story. Going back to the U.S., what will you share with your friends and families back home? Um, definitely um, just the impactful message of forgiveness and just understanding how unified the Catholic Church is and seeing that all these different families from different backgrounds, there's this lovely unity and we can just see God's love through each and every family despite differences. So many testimonies, ideas, inspiring stories and people and families here at the World Meeting of Families. It's a real honor to be here and hear all of those stories about faith, life, about the family and learn from it. Here at the World Meeting of Families for EWTN, Andreas Townhaus. It's great to get an inside look at Paul VI Hall where these speaker, these speeches and panels have taken place. But again, the, those, that event is over. You know, the, the speeches yes. from the lady are done, from the married couples, and now we're preparing from Pope Francis and the homily that he's going to give. Small, important thing to note that Paul VI Hall is named, obviously, after Pope St. Paul VI, who was the pope who's remembered mostly, I think, 
for Humani Vitae. Yes. His teachings and reteachings of, of what the church believes on contraception, on the importance of spousal dignity, of, of all of that. We're building on some of those building blocks here with the World Meeting of Families, and we're building on Pope St. John Paul II. So it's again that idea of, of legacy, of continuity, of fidelity that we have seen throughout this, which raises, I think, a very important point that we need to talk about, I, I, I would propose, and that yeah. is that we have not heard, as one would expect, uh, a list from the speakers of grievances. Hmm. On the contrary, uh, Of right? objections, right? saying that what the church is proposing is too hard, I can't live this, so let's change the teachings of the church. Instead, we have seen constant recourse uh, mm. to conforming ourselves to Christ, conforming ourselves to the ch what the church teaches, applying it in our lives, and suddenly discovering freedom and happiness. Absolutely. We must conform. The church does not conform to us. Well, that's because the gospel doesn't conform to us, right? Exactly. Um, it, I think you're right, Matthew. It's sort of uh, the Humanae Vitae in 1968. Paul VI lived for another 10 years. He never released another encyclical after that. For the remainder of his pontificate, St. John Paul II took that up into things like the theology of the body, Evangelium Vitae, Familiaris Consortio. It's remarkable here. Uh, all, we heard several times couples refer to practicing natural family planning, right. mm -hmm. following the church's teaching. One family in particular was struggling to uh, conceive, were pressured to use artificial mm -hmm. methods. Re did not do that. We're really right. in the center. I think you're right, Matthew. It's, we're, we've become accustomed to hearing uh, many of the faithful or some of the faithful who tend to have loud voices, the ones who don't want to conform. Right. Here, there's been nothing but the church's teaching is true, and it's joyful, and it's life-giving. Absolutely. And this dissent from the church's teachings, this unwillingness uh, to conform to what the church teaches, which is the authentic blueprint for us, visions of authentic marriage in the faith, all of these things, there has not been a lot of press coverage here of the world meeting of families. I was about to say. And that extends as well to corners of the Catholic press, which has had apparently scant interest uh, in covering a lot of this. I would suggest precisely because what we have heard over these last few days is fidelity. It is this idea, I'm not going to recreate the church and her teaching simply because I find them difficult to live up to or because I want the church to conform to the world. We want the world to be shaped and converted by the church. The speeches have been a steady stream of affirmations of church teaching. And again, Pope Francis, we are expecting to give a mandate to everyone who's here. And if the media is not going to cover it extensively, it really is up to the faithful to take this, to be to be lights. And that's been another theme as well. It's up for the family to be lights to the world, um, especially, and, and it will be countercultural. It's It's been a really great week. I can't say it enough. I, I, I didn't know. I've never been to a world meeting of families. Both of you have. Mm -hmm. um, my only recent memory was the Dublin world meeting of families, which, you know, did have some of those elements of attempting to push for changes in doctrine. Uh, so I really didn't know what to expect when we came here this week, but it's been really remarkable. I'm really happy and uh, really grateful for the families who have given testimonies and for their own formation, all from all parts of the world. And they all spoke with a, we should say this, a unified voice. There was not a lot of diversity in right. this sense of like a or division is the better word. There was right. diversity without division. Yeah, that, that's absolutely well said. Um, how have you seen Pope Francis's fingerprints throughout this world meeting of families? Again, it was founded by St. John Paul II back in 1994. It's been 28 years since the first one. How has Pope Francis made his mark? Well, this is, a, by my calculation, I think this is his third it world is, meeting of yeah. families. So uh, we had Philadelphia, we had Dublin, now we have this. Right. This one in particular, all of it was set, uh, given its context, on that opening speech from Pope Francis. I, I don't want to belabor this idea of the field hospital again. But we're seeing Pope Francis is hitting those themes again of mercy, of forgiveness, of confidence in, in Christ. But those themes, I think, of mercy and forgiveness, which, which are so important in family life. We can see those fingerprints especially. Absolutely. And in a variety of ways, again, there was one couple who very, vul very vulnerably shared his infidelity, the husband, and how he had to ask forgiveness from his wife. Then we heard 
just was it earlier today the family who lost three children because of a drunk driver and they chose to forgive again forgiveness looks different but it's it's a, a muscle we have to practice exercise well and there was also the family I mean they spoke a little bit about forgiveness it wasn't the direct meaning of their mm -hmm. of their talk but the family which we had a Catholic woman marrying uh, a Muslim man right. Right. and how she's had to essentially leave the church to practice Islam because of his right. family and was so um, it was su such a non-starter for her and so so uncomfortable she finally was able he she had a conversation with him. That's another theme we're hearing, is dialogue within the family and talking as a family when you're hurt or you're wounded. Which ultimately led to his conversion to Catholicism Absolutely. just last spring, and they spoke about how joyful this past Easter was. Right. It was absolutely, it's an, been a lot of stories like that. I don't know, yeah. I, I, I presumed that, that many of these families were nominated by their local bishops mm -hmm. to uh, give these testimonies. And I have to say, the, the, Congre the Dicastery for Family Life made some really great choices on who they were invited to give and these then, talks. As you're asking about the, the, sort of the fingerprints of Pope Francis, I, I would say in some ways it's more his footprints. Huh. In, in one sense, that um, he's not at the moment doing a lot of walking. Yes. We can, and yeah. he has referred and he has dedicated, uh, we've talked about this, uh, his Angelus, uh, I should say his general audiences right. over the last weeks, uh, to what it means to grow old. Yes. We have a, right in front of us tonight somebody who talks openly about that as old age comes. This is a, a slow, slow farewell, as he puts it. Mm. But we saw throughout this uh, world meeting of families the discussion of the divide of generations of the wisdom of the elderly yes. of the vulnerability of the elderly how they need to be cared for but also how they need to be allowed to play a role in the lives of families uh, especially their grandchildren and their children which will take an intentionality you know there was really an emphasis on we're all living busy frantic lives you have to be intentional about scheduling this time you know speaking of Pope Francis and he is obviously you know he's getting older he's speaking openly about yes. that we when we saw him for the first time here at the world's meeting of families he was in a wheelchair uh, there was as we were kicking off our coverage at the world's meeting of families a high amount of speculation that this was going to be the week that he was going to resign. Obviously, we have not seen that happen. Right. There, that was a lot of unfounded speculation. But can you address those concerns? Uh, yeah, well, we uh, basically when we began all of our conversations here on, on Monday, yeah. uh, we began hearing these, frankly, wild speculation that his, his resignation was perhaps that day. What we actually saw instead was a response in some ways from Pope Francis and the Holy See with uh, what I thought was a very strong general audience. And now we are seeing him here, but then we also had the announcement of at least the plan mm -hmm. for his trip to Canada. Pope Francis himself has said he's not going anywhere. We heard other members in his circle mm -hmm. saying, you don't have to have legs, but a brain. Exactly. And exactly. we're seeing that at play here. Yeah, absolutely. He has that inflamed ligament in his knee. He's talked about how painful that is. I, I think you were mentioning earlier, he's talked about, oh, it's embarrassing. It's you humbling. Know? It's, it's very humbling. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, you know, the church, and one of the themes that we've also had is that the church is a family. Right. right? And so if the, if the church is a family, in many ways, Pope Francis is the papa, right? Mm -hmm. He's the papa. Um, he might he might say he's now the grandpapa. Um, so we are going to have to watch our papa sort of grow old. And just like every family has to experience in their own homes. Yeah. And that's what, what we're watching in here. Yeah. There's also been this theme of isolation, of families being divided. Again, going back to that theme of the young and old and the importance of bridging that gap, of bringing them together. And it's when we do that, too, there's more support system in the family. There's a natural built-in support system and community for each and every single family member. There's also been an emphasis this week on married saints. We have to mention our the heavenly patrons <laughs> of this 10th world meaning of families, the Quattrochi family. Yeah, Maria and Luigi Beltrami Quattrochi. One died in 1951, the other in 1965. They're, one of their children uh, was had her cause open for canonization in 2018. We talked to Francesco Quattrochi about that whole experience. He, he was adopted by her. So this is a, a holy family beatified by Pope St. John Paul II in 2001, the first couple to be beatified. They were sort of leapfrogged subsequently right. by, the, by the Martins, right. uh, the parents of Therese of Lisieux. But it, 
those role models in holiness, but what was the theme about that? This wasn't some unattainable ideal in which someone could say, well, I can't be a saint. Right. No, actually, everyone is called to be a saint, right. and here's how they did it. It was doing extraordinary things in the perfection of the virtues in ordinary circumstances in everyday life. You said every day, Father. Yes, yeah. well, I, you know, we can see now that it, it does appear the Holy Father will not and, be celebrating And the with Mass. that, we go to Mass in St. Peter's Square. Coming down the steps of the Basilica, accompanied by many bishops we see probably accompanying their delegations here to Rome. For those of you following in a missal, today's liturgy will follow the Sunday liturgy for the 13th Sunday in Ordinary Time. together with the Diocese of Rome, has organized this 10th World Meeting of Families. His Eminence now incensing the altar, a reminder to us, now incensing a beautiful icon of Our Lady, reminiscent of the icon in front of which our Holy Father always goes in the Basilica of St. Mary Major before his trips, reminding us that every holy sacrifice of the Mass in which we participate opens us to being in communion with everyone in heaven as well as everyone on earth. Nel nome del Padre, e del Figlio, e dello Spirito Santo. Amen. La pace sia con voi. E con il tuo Spirito. Fratelli e sorelle, il nostro essere radunati nel Signore manifesta oggi in modo eloquente che la Chiesa è famiglia di Dio. Gathered in the Lord today, eloquently manifests that the Lord, that the Church is the family of God, and that we are all fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Familial love is the icon of the mystery of Christ, who loves his Church, and is at the same time 
called to the path of holiness, not exempt from trials and tribulations. With immense confidence in God's mercy and in his love as Father, let us call to mind our sins with the certainty of being healed through his forgiveness. We pause. Confesso a Dio omnipotente. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, blessed ever-Virgin Mary, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. Excelsis Deo.
now pray. Preghiamo. O oh Dio, che ci hai reso figli e della luce con il tuo spirito da adozione. Fa che non ricadiamo nelle tenebre dell'errore, ma restiamo sempre oh God, luminosi. Who through the grace of adoption chose us to be children of light. Grant, we pray, that we may not be wrapped in the darkness of error, but always be seen to stand in the bright light of truth. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the first book of Kings. The Lord said to Elijah, Go, you are to anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, of Abel Mohola, as prophet to succeed you. Leaving there, Elijah came on Elisha, son of Shaphat, as he was plowing behind twelve yoke of oxen. He himself being with the twelfth. Elijah passed near to him and threw his cloak over him. Elisha left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother, then I will follow you, he said. Elijah answered, Go, go back, for have I done anything to you? Elisha turned away, took the pair of oxen, and slaughtered them. He used the plow for cooking the oxen, then gave to his men, who ate. He then rose and followed Elijah and became his servant. today is, You are my inheritance, O Lord. Sei tu, Signore, l'unico mio Protaggi mio Dio, in te mi rifugio. Ho detto al Signore, il mio Signore sei tu. Keep me, O oh God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, my Lord, are you? O oh Lord, my allotted portion and my cup. You it is who hold fast my lot. Benedico il Signore che mi ha dato consiglio, anche di notte il mio animo mi istruisce. Io I bless the Lord who counsels me, even in the night my heart exhorts me. I set the Lord ever before me. With him at my right hand, I shall not be disturbed. Oh, 
per questo gioisce il mio cuore ed esulta la mia anima anche il mio corpo riposa al sicuro perché non therefore my heart is glad and my soul rejoices my body too abides in confidence because you will not abandon my soul to the netherworld, nor will you suffer your faithful one to undergo corruption. Sentiero della vita, gioia piena nella tua presenza. You will show me the path of life, fullness of joy in your presence, the delights at your right hand forever. Our second reading this evening will be proclaimed in Spanish and comes from the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians. Hermanos, para la libertad nos ha liberado Cristo. Manteneos pues firmes y no dejéis que vuelvan a someteros a yugos de esclavitud. Brothers and sisters, for freedom Christ set us free. So stand firm and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. For you were called for freedom, brothers and sisters, but do not use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Rather, serve one another through love. Porque toda la ley se cumple en una sola frase que es, amarás a tu prójimo como a ti mismo, pero cuidado. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you go on biting and devouring one another, beware that you are not consumed by one another. I say then, live by the Spirit, and you will certainly not gratify the desire of the flesh. For the flesh has desires against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. These are opposed to each other, so that you may not do what you want. But if you are guided by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Verbum Domini.
gospel now receiving a blessing as the choir provides the gospel antiphon speak lord your servant is listening you have words of everlasting life procession now making its way to the ambo we will hear the gospel proclaimed according to Luke we prepare our hearts to welcome the word of the Lord Dominus vobiscum. Lexio Sancti Evangelii secundum Lucam. The deacon now sensing the book of the Gospels, reminding us that the Lord is truly present in his word. Mentre stavano compiendosi i giorni in cui sarebbe stato elevato in alto, Gesù when the days for Jesus being taken up were fulfilled, he resolutely determined to journey to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On the way, they entered a Samaritan village to prepare for his reception there, but they would not welcome him because the destination of his journey was Jerusalem. When the disciples James and John saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? Jesus turned and rebuked them, and they journeyed to another village. As they were proceeding on their journey, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus answered him, Foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. And to another he said, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, let me go first and bury my father. But he answered him, Let the dead bury their dead. But you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to my family at home. To him, Jesus said, no one who sets a hand to the plow and looks to what was left behind is fit for the kingdom of God. this blessing from the Lord and his word. Our 
Holy Father now preparing himself to deliver his homily, although he is not celebrating this Mass, he is in attendance, sitting, assisting at this Mass on the side of the altar here in St. Peter's Square. Nell'ambito del decimo incontro mondiale delle famiglie, questo è il momento del rendimento di grazie. In this tenth world meeting of families, it is now the time for thanksgiving. Today we bring before God with gratitude, as if in a great offertory procession, all the fruits that the Holy Spirit has sown in you, dear families. Some of you have taken part in the moments of reflection and sharing here in the Vatican. Others have led them and participated in them in the various dioceses, creating a kind of vast constellation. I think of the rich variety of experiences, plans, and dreams, as well as concerns and uncertainties, which you have shared with one another. Let us now present all of these to the Lord and ask him to sustain you with his strength and love. You are fathers, mothers, children, grandparents, uncles, and aunts. You are adults and children, young and old. Each of you brings a different experience of family but all of you have one hope and prayer, that God bless and keep your families and all the families of the world. St. Paul, in today's second reading, spoke to us about freedom. Freedom is one of the most cherished ideals and goals of the people of our time. Everyone wants to be free, free of conditioning and limitations, free of every kind of prison, cultural, social, or economic prisons. And yet, how many people lack the greatest freedom of all, which is interior freedom? The greatest freedom is interior freedom. The apostle reminds us Christians that interior freedom is above all a gift when he says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Freedom is something we receive, it's a gift. All of us are born with many forms of interior and exterior conditioning, and especially with a tendency to selfishness, that is, making ourselves the center of everything and being concerned only with our own interests. This is the slavery from which Christ has set us free. Unless there be any mistake, St. Paul warns us that the freedom given to us by God is not the false and empty freedom of the world, which in reality is an opportunity for self-indulgence. No, the freedom that Christ gained at the price of his own blood is completely directed to love, so that, as the Apostle tells us again today, through love, you may become slaves of one another. All of you married couples in building your family made, with the help of Christ's grace, a courageous decision not to use your freedom for yourselves, but to love the persons that God has put at your side. Instead of living like little islands, you became slaves of one another. That is how freedom is exercised in the family. There are no planets or satellites, each traveling on its own orbit. The family is the place of encounter, of sharing, of going forth from ourselves in order to welcome others and stay near them. The family is the first place where we learn to love. Let's not forget this ever. The family is the first place where we learn to love. Brothers and sisters, even as we reaffirm this with profound conviction, we also know full well that it is not always the case for any number of reasons and a variety of situations. And so, in praising the beauty of the family, we also feel compelled today more than ever to defend the family. Let us not allow the family to be poisoned by the toxins of selfishness, individualism, 
today's culture of indifference and waste. And as a result, the family might lose its very DNA, which is the spirit of acceptance and service. The relationship between the prophets Elijah and Elisha as presented in the first reading reminds us of the relationship between the generations, the passing on of witness from parents to children. In today's world, that relationship is not an easy one, and frequently it is a cause for concern. Parents fear that children will not be able to make their way amid the complexity and confusion of our societies, where everything seems chaotic and precarious, and in the end, might lose their way. This fear makes some parents anxious, and others hyper overprotective. At times, it even ends up thwarting the desire to bring new life into the world. We do well to reflect on the relationship between Elijah and Elisha. Elijah, at a moment of crisis and fear for the future, receives from God the command to anoint Elisha as his successor. God makes Elijah realize that the world does not end with him and commands him to pass on his mission to another. This is the meaning of the gesture described in the text. Elijah throws his mantle over the shoulders of Elisha. And from that moment, the disciple takes the place of the master in order to carry on his prophetic ministry in Israel. God thus shows that he has confidence in the young Elisha. In this gesture of Elijah passing his prophetic mission to Elijah, he trusts a young person, he trusts the future, and that action, all type of hope is in that action, and it's through hope that he passes on his testimony. How important it is for parents to reflect on God's way of acting. God loves young people, but that does not mean that he preserves them from every risk, from every challenge, and from all suffering. God is not anxious and overprotective. Let's think well about this. God is not anxious and overprotective, but on the contrary, he trusts young people, and he calls each of them to scale the heights of life and mission. So let's think of the child Samuel, the adolescent David, or the young Jeremiah, and above all, let's think of that young girl. She could have been a 17-year-old who conceived Jesus, the Virgin Mary. He, in, he trusted a young girl, a teenager. Dear parents, the Word of God shows us the way not to shield our children from the slightest hardship and suffering, but to try to communicate to them a passion for life, to enkindle in them the desire to discover their vocation and embrace the great mission that God has in mind for them. It was precisely that discovery that made Alicia courageous and determined. It made him become an adult. The decision to leave his parents behind and to sacrifice the oxen is a sign that Alicia realized that it was now up to him, that it was time to accept God's call and to carry on the work of his master. This he would do courageously until the very end of his life. Dear parents, if you help your children to discover and to accept their vocation, you will see that they too will be gripped by this mission, and they will find the strength they need to confront and overcome the difficulties of life. I'd also like to add that for educators, the best way to help others to follow their vocation is to embrace our own vocation with faithful love. That is what the disciples saw Jesus do. Today's gospel shows us an emblematic moment when Jesus when Jesus is resolutely determined to go to Jerusalem, knowing well that there he would be condemned and put to death, 
On his way to Jerusalem, Jesus met with rejection from the inhabitants of Samaria, which aroused the indignant reaction of James and John. But he accepted that rejection because it was part of his vocation. He met rejection from the very start, first in the synagogue in Nazareth, now in Samaria, and he was about to be rejected in Jerusalem. Jesus accepted it all, for he came to take upon himself our sins. In a similar way, nothing can be more encouraging for children than to see their parents living their marriage and family life as a mission, demonstrating fidelity and patience despite difficulties or moments of sadness in times of trial. What Jesus encountered in Samaria takes place in every Christian vocation, including that of the family. We all know that. There are moments when we have to take upon ourselves the resistance, the opposition, the rejection and misunderstanding born of human hearts, and with the grace of Christ, transform these into acceptance of others and gratuitous love. Immediately after that episode, which in some way shows us Jesus' own vocation, the Gospel presents three other callings, three other vocations represented by three aspiring disciples of Jesus. The first is told not to seek a fixed home, a secure situation in following Jesus, for the Master has nowhere to, let, to place his head. To follow Jesus means to set out on a never-ending trip with him through the events of life. How true this is for you married couples. By accepting the call to marriage and family, you too have left the nest and set out on a trip without knowing beforehand where exactly it would lead and what new situations, unexpected events, and surprises would eventually lie in store for you and even some sad surprises. This is what it means to journey with the Lord. It is a lively, unpredictable, and marvelous journey of discovery. Let us remember that every disciple of Jesus finds his or her repose in doing God's will each day, wherever it may lead. A second disciple is told not to go back to bury his dad. This has nothing to do with disobeying the fourth commandment, which remains ever valid. Rather, it is a summons to obey above all the first commandment, to love God above all things. The same thing happens with the third disciple who is called to follow Christ resolutely and with an undivided heart without looking back, not even to say farewell to the members of his family. Dear families, you too have been asked not to have other priorities, not to look back, not to miss your former life, your former freedom, with its deceptive illusions. Life becomes fossilized when it is not open to the newness of God's call and pines for the past. When we're not open to God's new call and we yearn for the past, that fossilizes us. When Jesus calls us also in the case of marriage and family life, he asks us to keep looking ahead, and he always precedes us on the way. He always precedes us in love and service, and those who follow him will not be disappointed. Dear brothers and sisters, providentially, the readings proposed to us by today's liturgy all speak of vocation, which is the theme of this 10th World Meeting of Families, family love, a vocation, and a path to holiness. Strengthened by these words of life, I encourage you to take up with renewed conviction the journey of family love sharing with all the members of your families the joy of this calling. It's not an easy path. It's not an easy journey. There are dark moments, difficult moments. 
in which we think that everything's over. May the love you share with one another always be open, directed outwards, capable of touching those who are weaker and wounded, the frail in body and the frail in spirit and all whom you meet along the way. For love, including family love, is purified and strengthened whenever it is shared with others. To bet on family love is courageous. It takes courage to get married. We see how many young people don't have the courage to get married. And often, some mothers tell me, uh, do something, talk to my children, who's not getting married, he or she is 37 years old, but, uh, but stop ironing his shirts and maybe that'll help him go ahead to, to get out of the nest. Because uh, family love also has to to urge uh, children to, to learn how to fly on their own, not to possess them, uh, to let them be free. And there's families who always, there are crises and moments of difficulties in families. Let's not, let's not take the easy road and go back to mama, no. Go ahead, keep going forward. Keep betting courageously. There will be difficult moments. There will be hard moments. Keep, keep moving ahead always. Your husband or wife um, has that spark of love that began everything. Let it, let it come out in you. Rediscover that love. And that can help us in the moments of crisis. The church is with you. Indeed, the church is in you. For the church was born of a family, the Holy Family of Nazareth, and is made up mostly of families. May the Lord help you each day to persevere in unity, peace, and joy and to persevere in difficult moments, that faithful perseverance that makes us live always better, and to show everyone that you meet that God is love and that God is communion of life. Thank you. Our Holy Father concluding his homily in which we also saw moments when he spoke directly from his heart spontaneously to the families who have gathered here, we now see a beautiful icon of the wedding at Cana. Jesus hovering over the, the water jars and pouring the, the wine into a chalice as he draws back the curtain in, from the marriage in which there is no wine to marriage in Christ in which wine is copious. He himself giving us the, the model of being that bridegroom in love with his church, always faithful, choosing to die for her, this image, which as our Holy Father reminded us, is the image of the church which is in each and every one of us. A church, as again our Holy Father reminded us, was born from a family out of the Holy Family of Nazareth. Therefore, we discover the church in our family. Through the difficulties, through the hardships, we persevere to death, knowing that, as our Holy Father told us, Christ always precedes us, showing the way. We can bank on that, as he said. We can bank courageously on the grace of the sacrament of marriage because the person who instituted it died so that we might participate in his love. We now move on to our creed.
Fratelli e sorelle, il Signore ci invita a seguirlo con decisione e fermezza. Dear brothers and sisters, the Lord invites us to follow him resolutely and courageously bear witness to being his disciples. Docile to the action of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Father that our path will always be sustained by his grace. Dominum de precemur. Père Saint, 
In French, we pray, Most Holy Father, who calls your church on the paths of evangelical perfection, grant that every Christian community might manifest the face of a true family who knows how to love, give, and forgive. In Polish, we pray. Father of reconciliation, who invites us to peace and to mutual forgiveness, enlighten the minds of government leaders so that they might guide the peoples with wisdom along the way of justice, fleeing from every conflict that generates destruction, suffering, and hunger. Dominum de precemur. Pai dos pobres. In Portuguese, we pray, Father of the poor, who are the only good for those who call upon you in their suffering, open our hearts so that in the face of those who reach out their hands, we might learn how to joyfully encounter Christ, who made himself poor for us. Dominum de precemur. In Arabic, we pray, loving Father, who from the dawn of creation blessed the family, the first human community, assist married couples with your spirit so that they might radiate the industrious and fruitful joy of the gospel. And in German we pray, Father of every grace, who generously lavishes your gifts, accompany engaged couples and assist newly married couples so that they might grow in mutual love, that they might be generous in the gift of their lives and open to contributing to the life of the church and society. Dominum de precemur. O Padre, che ti fai conoscere de coloro che ti cercano con cuore sincero. Ascolta le pre nostre preghiere. O Father, who make yourself known to all who seek you with a sincere heart, hear our prayers, and grant us the wisdom of your Spirit, so that living each day the gospel message of the cross, we may truly become disciples of Christ, your Son. Amen. We now move from the Liturgy of the Word to the Liturgy of the Eucharist with our offertory procession. Here we see a few families, some in traditional dress as the choir chants where charity and love are sincere, God is there. children now presenting the ciborium. Others will see with 
children in their hands, in their arms, offering the gifts that will soon become the body and blood of the Lord, reminding us that we too offer ourselves to be transformed by God's grace into images of his beloved Son. An elderly couple here now bringing the gifts, a reminder of our Holy Father's insistence that we include the elderly, that we might not lose our roots. Farrell now preparing the thurifer, thurible to incense the gifts on the altar. Sensing the various aspects here, we are reminded that it is really Jesus himself who is being reverenced in the altar that stands for him, in the gifts on the altar who will, which will soon be transformed. is in the minister who images Christ in a very special way during the celebration of the Eucharist and ourselves. All of us who through baptism bear Jesus in a very, very special way. As we view once again the icon here, there's also a reliquary here, which contains the relic of the first couple who was beatified together by John Paul I in 2001. They were a couple who lived in Rome, Luigi and Maria Beltrame Quattrocchi, a family who actually began pastoral care to families here in Rome. Pregate fratelli e sorelle, perché il mio e il vostro sacrificio sia gradito a Dio Padre Omnipotente. O 
Dio, che per mezzo dei segni sacramentali who graciously accomplished the effects of your mysteries, grant, we pray, that the deeds by which we serve you may be worthy of these sacred gifts. Amen. The Eucharistic prayer that will be prayed today is Eucharistic prayer number three. In alto i nostri cuori, rendiamo grazie al Signore Dio nostro. È veramente cosa buona e giusta. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For when your children were scattered afar by sin, through the blood of your Son and the power of the Spirit, you gathered them again to yourself, that a people formed as one by the unity of the Trinity, made the body of Christ and the temple of the Holy Spirit, might, to the praise of your manifold wisdom, be manifest as the Church. And so, in company with the choirs of angels, we praise you, and with joy, we proclaim Veramente santo sei tu, o Padre, ed è giusto che ogni creatura ti lodi. Per mezzo del tuo Figlio, il Signore nostro Gesù Cristo, nella potenza dello Spirito Santo, fai vivere e sanctifichi l'universo e continui a radonare intorno a te un popolo che dall'Oriente all'Occidente Offre al tuo nome il sacrificio perfetto. Ti preghiamo umilmente, sanctifichi e consagra con il tuo spirito i doni che ti abbiamo presentato, perché diventino il corpo e il sangue del tuo figlio, il Signore nostro Gesù Cristo. 
che ci ha comandato a celebrare questi misteri. Egli, nella notte in cui veniva tradito, prese il pane, ti rese grazia con la preghiera di benedizione, lo spezzò, lo diede ai suoi discepoli e disse, «Prendete ed mangiatene tutti. Questo è il mio corpo, offerto in sacrificio per voi». Allo stesso modo, dopo aver cenato, prese il calice, ti rese grazia con la preghiera di benedizione, lo diede ai suoi discepoli e disse, «Prendete e bevetene tutti. Questo è il calice del mio sangue per la nuova ed eterna alianza, versato per voi e per tutti» in remissione dei peccati. Fate questo in memoria di me. Mistero della fede Celebrando il memoriale della passione redentrice del tuo figlio, della sua admirabile resurrezione e ascensione al cielo, nella testa della sua venuta nella gloria, ti offriamo, oh Padre, in rendimento di grazie, questo sacrificio vivo e santo. Guarda con amore e riconosci nell'offerta della tua Chiesa la vittima immolata per la nostra redenzione. E a noi che ci nutriamo del corpo e del sangue del tuo Figlio, dona la pienezza dello Spirito Santo, perché diventiamo in Cristo un solo corpo e un solo Spirito. Lo Spirito Santo faccia di noi un'offerta perenne a Te gradita, perché possiamo ottenere il regno promesso con i Tuoi eletti, con la Beata Maria, Vergine e Madre di Dio, San Giuseppe, suo Sposo, i Tuoi Santi Apostoli, i gloriosi Martiri, e tutti i santi nostri intercessori presso di te. Ti preghiamo, o oh Padre, questo sacrificio della nostra riconciliazione doni pace e salvezza al mondo intero. Conferma nella fede e nell'amore la tua Chiesa pellegrina sulla terra, il tuo servo, il nostro Papa Francesco, l'ordine episcopale i presbiteri, i diaconi e il popolo che tu hai redento. Ascolta la preghiera di questa famiglia che hai convocato alla tua presenza nel giorno in cui Cristo ha vinto la morte e ci ha resi partecipi della sua vita immortale. Ricongiunge a te, Padre misericordioso, tutti i tuoi figli ovunque dispersi. Accogli nel tuo regno i nostri fratelli e sorelle defunti, e tutti coloro che in pace con te hanno lasciato questo mondo, concedi anche a noi di ritrovarci insieme a godere per sempre della tua gloria 
in Cristo nostro Signore, per mezzo del quale Tu, o oh Dio, doni al mondo ogni bene. Per Cristo, con Cristo e in Cristo, a Te, Dio Padre Onnipotente, nell'unità dello Spirito Santo, ogni onore e gloria per tutti i secoli dei secoli. We will now be invited to pray the Lord's Prayer. Obedienti alla parola del Salvatore e formato del suo divino insegnamento, osiamo dire. Liberaci, O Signore, da tutti i mali, Concede, concedi la pace ai nostri giorni e con l'aiuto della Tua misericordia vivremo sempre liberi del peccato e sicuri da ogni turbamento. Nella testa che si compia la beata speranza e venga il, Salvat il nostro Salvatore Gesù Cristo. Signore Gesù Cristo, che hai detto ai tuoi apostoli, vi lascio la pace, vi do la mia pace. Non guardare ai nostri peccati, ma alla fede della tua Chiesa, e dona la unità e pace secondo la tua volontà. Tu che vivi e reni nei secoli dei secoli. La pace del Signore sia sempre con voi.
Ecco l'agnello di Dio. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Cardinal Farrell now receiving our Lord in Holy Communion as we will hear a beautiful communion hymn. Great is the mystery of the eternal wedding banquet of Christ the spouse and his church. This is EWTN's continuous coverage of the 10th World's Meeting of Families. You are watching the Holy Mass presided over by Pope Francis in St. Peter's Square. Father Thomas Petrie will now lead us in an act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Amen. As we suspected, the Mass here at the World's Meeting of Families was celebrated by Cardinal Kevin Farrell, but Pope Francis did give the homily. And uh, you, you said something I thought that was um, very interesting, Catherine, that as you were reading through and your assessment of the homily was that uh, Pope Francis touched on everything that we've been talking about for the last four days. So yes. you, it's pretty clear he was paying attention to everything that was happening in the, in the Paul VI. <laughs> exactly. Hall. He really weaved in the various themes, but there was this overriding theme, I thought, of combating our inherent selfish, na selfish nature and instinct, but instead giving a gift of self. He uh, was really um, strong on the notion of freedom and true freedom, freedom that is not hindered by uh, selfishness, as you say, Catherine, or the conditioning of cultures or addictions. Um, he really challenged the family to live the freedom of what it means in the family, of, of complete self-acceptance and acceptance of the other. It made that uh, important contrast in this that, uh, as he writes, freedom is one of the goods most valued and sought after by modern and contemporary man. Everyone desires to be free, to have no conditioning, to be unrestrained, and therefore aspires to be free from all kinds of prisons, cultural, social, economic. But then he says, yet how many people lack the greatest freedom, inner freedom? Well, you know, he. the other theme that we saw in the homily, as we've also been talking, is this passing the baton from the old to the young. And he had some real concrete advice. He, he identified with parents who um, often feel anxious mm -hmm. about their children going mm -hmm. into the world, especially, mm -hmm. and he, no, he noted, especially in a world in which um, there are so many difficulties and trials uh, that we currently experience in the world. And he said parents can be either anxious or they might be overprotective. And then he said that God is neither anxious yes. nor overprotective. He trusts the young. And in fact, he made some off-the-cuff remarks, if you will, <laughs> extending on that very theme. He, uh, Matthew, can you speak about that Yeah, as well? he did. Well, this is a, sort of a classic Francis where uh, when, once you see the script sort of drop in his lap, it, it, you know that... He's going to have some probably memorable things to say. And he did. Uh, he's talking about young people needing to have the courage to commit, which is something that obviously we've talked about and we've heard. 
He says, gives advice, for example, to mothers that if you're trying to move your sons along, he said, well, stop ironing their shirts. Exactly. He said, you know, I hear these complaints from parents that their 37-year-old son isn't married. Well, stop ironing their shirts. And he also um, called out parents, yeah, not to coddle, but also he had some strong words for Well, for the young. Exactly. For the young, he, he, he challenged them because in his homily, he said that God wants to set the young to rise and scale the heights of life. Mm -hmm. And he trusts them and he will be with them. But then at the end, and he was a little bit in a sort of, it was extemporaneously, said, you know, don't be afraid. And, and don't, but he said very strongly, don't run home to mama either. Exactly. <laughs> Let's not take the easy road and go back to mama. I think that will be a classic line that we remember from this. Yeah, and then he was uh, talking about the vocation. And yeah. that's something else we've been hearing quite a bit about. He says that he talks about an educator. The best way to help another follow his or her vocation is to embrace his or her own vocation with faithful love, with this idea of fidelity. Yes. That, that, it undergirds marriage that undergirds really passing along this wisdom. Absolutely. He really encouraged people to have have courage. It takes courage to get married. There was this powerful line towards the end of his homily. Love, even family love, is purified and strengthened when it is given. Again, this idea of this gift of self in the family to go against our intuitive nature of being selfish. He had this image that I thought was really powerful, um, that we are not planets or satellites traveling in our own orbit. We can't be isolated. We can't be our own islands in that way. He's very, he's very keen to build up the family with this homily. To, he, he says he hopes that those who have participated in this world meeting of families are able to return with a certain confidence, you know, in, in their life as family and their mission. Yes. And then he also uh, used uh, the phrase in Italian, the, the, the translation of it is to, to search to how to transmit your passion mm. for life. And I go back to his general audience in which he was talking about the, as you grow older, uh, that it is a slow, slow farewell. But then it, it's, it's a, he said it becomes a kind of testimony that I have lived, which means you have to have a certain passion for life, but that has to be passed on. It has to be given to the generation that's going to follow you. And that brings in then to the readings here of Elisha, uh, who was trusted enough to receive this mantle this yeah. responsibility and then off the cuff he said that this old man trusted the young man mm. and just another note about the holy mass here in st peter's square is that it was an elderly couple that brought up the gift and this is a symbol of remembering the elders so we don't forget our roots just again hitting on this theme that we've seen throughout the world's meeting of families using the gospel he noted that the vocations that jesus gives us whether it's the married life or religious life or priesthood is in fact of a, the first step he said of this vocation is, is, is it's a dynamic journey and we don't know and he said married married couples and families have that same call to follow Christ wherever he goes and not to be always certain where this journey is going to lead you have to have courage he said this Sunday's gospel this gospel reading presents three calls first not to seek a stable abode the second there's this urge to not bury your dead. And what's meant by that, it, it seems, you know, let the dead bury the dead. That's not about going against the fourth commandment. Instead, it's about following the first commandment and this invitation to love God above all things. And finally, this call to follow Christ resolutely and wholeheartedly. This is a, it's, it's a great homily. And I think um, it really, as, as we said earlier, captures all the themes that we've been talking about uh, during this world meeting of families. Absolutely. This idea of freedom, too, uh, it's a generational thing. We, we see in younger people uh, a desire for freedom. Uh, we see in culture this desire for freedom, but we keep coming back to, to what is almost an unanswerable question by culture. What do you mean by freedom? Freedom today is license. It is life without consequences, which brings us in a way to what happened just yesterday with the overturning of Roe v. Wade. Yeah, absolutely. Hitting on that theme of there is this true freedom in embracing your vocation. I mean, there was this theme of not being afraid to commit, having courage to get married. And he even said, you know, families don't regret your so-called, you know, freedom before marriage. Jesus calls us to look ahead. He was really... Um, 
really calling us all not to, oh, long for the days before you're married, long for the days before children. There's That's a false idea of freedom. It's a false idea because, you know, you can't go back. Right. We can never really go back on these things. And that can be a temptation, you know. Yeah. Sometimes you see that in young couples who have just had children, you know, a year or two in of having children that right. remember the times when we used to be able to go out to di dinner if we wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, but that's... Family necessarily is always in a forward trajectory. It's always in forward momentum. Exactly. But with regard to a vocation, it, it's very similar for you as a priest. That's correct. Absolutely. We go back now to the Holy Mass. Sacrificio che abbiamo offerto May this divine sacrifice we have offered and received fill us with life, O Lord. We pray so that bound to you in lasting charity we may bear fruit that lasts forever. And now, according to the schedule, His Eminence, Cardinal Kevin Farrell will now greet the Holy Father. Holy Father, on behalf of all the families present here in this square and those connected with us from all over the world, I wish to thank you from the bottom of my heart for making this 10th World Meeting of Families possible with which we conclude the year of the family, Amoris Laetitia, which you yourself announced on March 19th of 2021. In this year, you sought to give new impetus to pastoral care of the families in the dioceses around the world. Holy Father, bishops, priests, and laity have worked everywhere with enthusiasm and dedication to listen to the concrete needs of families and to review methodologies and content of pastoral care. Urgent by now is a renewed commitment in which pastors and families who are well trained know how to collaborate to be more effective in the task of accompanying children, young people, married couples, and entire families in the moral and spiritual challenges of today's societies. What is needed is co-responsibility and a concrete and effective ecclesial communion. In particular, Holy Father, I wish to thank you for the help, your interest and closeness that you wanted to show to families through concrete acts of your pontificate, such as the two synods on the family, from which was born the, exhorta the apostolic exhortation Amoris Laetitia, the rich pastoral magisterium, which you have given us in the cycle of catechesis on the family, the, your many pronouncements in defense of life and your wise words to make us rediscover the role of grandparents in families, even establishing a special world day of grandparents and the elderly. In particular, I thank you for the real gifts you have given to all families during this year that was dedicated to them, the letter to married couples, 
the recent documented um, the recent document on the catechumenal itineraries for married life the touching 10 videos on the family and the cycle of catechesis on old age that you are currently developing through which you pick up once again the theme of the elderly we thank you your holiness for all your work in support of the family which allowing them to feel more and more your affection as a father and allows them to understand and makes them understand that you understand their challenges and their problems. The dicastery is working together with bishops, conferences, and dioceses to help them respond to your call to evangelize families and to evangelize with families. There's still a lot of work to be done. But after this meeting with you, Holy Father, our hearts are renewed with confidence and enthusiasm. Families with their specific vocation to holiness are truly the most beautiful face of the church and contribute in a unique way to evangelize the world with their ability to witness to love and to fortitude in difficulties and also witness to perseverance in the trusting surrender to God. I am also pleased to announce that the next gathering of families with Pope Francis will be the Jubilee of Families, which will be celebrated here in Rome as part of the Jubilee of 2025. While the 11th World Meeting of Families will take place in 2028. Let us pray. Let us begin to pray that these two will be tremendous events of grace that will touch the hearts of thousands of families. Thank you, Holy Father, for your nearness, your closeness, and your dedication to families with filial love. We pray daily for you and for your mission. Words of thanksgiving of Cardinal Kevin Farrell, the Cardinal Prefect of the Dicastery for Laity Family of Life, now personally shaking hands with Pope Francis, who is on his feet, uh, being assisted by his cane. And will now, uh, Pope Francis will now send forth these families with a special prayer of sending forth. Dear families, I invite you to continue the journey listening to the Father who calls you. Be missionaries along the highways and byways of the world. Do not walk alone. You young families, be guided by those who know the way. You who are further along, be companions on the way for others. You who are lost because of difficulties, do not be overcome by sadness. Trust in the love that God has placed in you. Plead daily with the Spirit to revive that love. Joyfully proclaim the beauty of being family. Proclaim to children and young people the grace of Christian matrimony. Give hope to those who have none. Act as if everything depended on you, knowing that everything must be entrusted to God. Be the ones to sew the fabric of a synodal society and church, creating relationships, multiplying love and life. Be signs of the living Christ. Do not be afraid of what the Lord asks of you, nor of being generous with him. 
Open yourselves to Christ. Listen to him in the silence of prayer. Accompany those who are more fragile. Carry those who are alone, refugees, abandoned. Be the seed of a more fraternal world. Be families with large hearts. Be the welcoming face of the church. May Mary, our mother, come to your aid when there is no more wine. May she be a companion in the moment of silence and trial. May she help you to walk together with her risen son. Amen. Those present now rising to their feet as we prepare for the final blessing. Il Signore sia con voi. Sia benedetto in nome del Signore. Il nostro aiuto è nel nome del Signore. Vi benedica Dio Omnipotente, Padre e Figlio e Spirito Santo. And at the conclusion of this liturgy, we sing the Salve Regina in honor of the Mother, our Mother, the Mother of the Lord. This now brings to a close our live broadcast of the concluding liturgy of the 10th World Meeting of Families from St. Peter's Square. We'll be back again tomorrow, Sunday at 12 noon local time.
And that concludes the Holy Mass with Pope Francis in St. Peter's Square. As we suspected, it was celebrated by Cardinal Kevin Farrell, the prefect of the Dicastery for Laity, Family, and Life. Pope Francis was on his feet, but he was using a cane. And we were also anticipating them to announce the next location for the world's meeting of families. Um, Matthew, what, what did they share in that regard? Well, it turns out it's not going very far. Right. Uh, as uh, Cardinal Farrell announced, uh, it will be celebrated here again in Rome in three years, part of the Jubilee. Father, we can talk a little bit more about that in a second. And then it will take place again in terms of the 11th World Meeting of Families in 2028. So we now have sort of a six-year window for what's going to happen. Right, which is a, a little bit of a departure from custom. Typically, the official World's Meeting of Families is every three years. This is a unique situation, that, th but it will be somewhat of a World's Meeting of well, Families. Well, part of the Jubilee. Right. That's correct. So we're still having the families gather every three right. years. It's, right, But 2025, the, the Holy Father has announced, will be a Jubilee year, which has many of the jubilee years will be a year of great uh, indulgences the, the theme he's announced for the 2025 jubilee is pilgrims of hope mm. so we're going to be focusing on hope which of course is one of the distinctive characteristics that marks cr christians our hope in the future and our hope uh, of, of eternity and that's a word that we've heard quite a bit over the last few days here at the world meeting of families that of hope that families must be places of hope and then become missionaries heralds of hope yeah. in a world that really needs it. Yes, just a programming note, the translations of the Holy Mass were provided by the Vatican. And towards the end, Pope Francis then gave a commission to the families, didn't he? Yeah, he, he reminded the families of why they were here and that they should be missionaries in the highways and byways of the world and not to be afraid, to always uh, be com that know that they would be companions of each other on the journey and be witnesses of Christ to the world. And in our very first conversation, which seems probably like a very long time right. ago now, I think it was every Tuesday, uh, in, our, in our preview of what was going to happen, we had a, a conversation about the fact that the family traditionally has been described as the cell or the building block of society. But Francis used a similar image in his uh, mandate or sending out. He said, be you who sow the fabric of society and of a synodal church creating relationships, multiplying love and life, be a sign of the living Christ. So that sort of a family, all families help to stitch together society, yes. which means that we need the thread to be strong, but also for what you end up with, like a tapestry. Right. You look at the tapestry from the front, it, it's beautiful. Sometimes it's a mess behind. Yeah. But what is out there projected is what matters. Again, this idea of coming together. Yeah, he, you know, he reminded them not to be afraid of what the Lord asks, and that's a good reminder for all of us, right? It can be, it can be um, uh, intimidating and sometimes uh, scary right. to know what the, when the Lord. We think the Lord is going to ask us to do something we're not ready to do or capable of doing. But the good news is He always makes us ready and makes us capable. Yes. And He knows that He knows where we are and He knows where we're going to be. Yes. And he says, open yourselves to Christ, listen to him in the silence of prayer, accompany those who are most fragile. And then he goes through his list. I'm reminded a little bit when he says, open yourselves to Christ, hmm. to John Paul II, the, the founder, the establisher of the World Meeting of Families with that great line, you've used it, be not afraid. Yeah. But then John Paul also had that memorable turn of phrase, throw open wide the doors to Christ. Yes, absolutely. You can still see, again, this was founded by St. John Paul II back in 1994, this beautiful tradition that it's continued. Let's speak about why it's so important that here we are gathered together in St. Peter's, the crowds coming together. Well, I mean, it's always, crowds have been gathering in St. Peter's for Mass for many years. Right. And as we can see on the screen, Pope Francis is back in his Pope Mobile. <laughs> He looked a little more mobile tonight, which is yes, always a good sign. Yes, yes. And this was the second time that we saw him at the World's Meeting of Families. We will see him again tomorrow, and we'll cover that as well with his Angelus prayer at St. Peter's. That's right. It, it is the traditional Angelus of, of the Holy Father, all Holy Fathers. It's usually a, always a good crowd. Here in Rome, there's uh, something of a weather advisory that's going to be extremely hot. Yes. It has been throughout this week, yes. which may have had a bit of an influence on attendance here. But you're right. This is the second time that we've seen Pope Francis. He's making very clear gestures. He wasn't up to being the, the main celebrant tonight, but he was here. Yes. Clearly a demonstration of the importance that he places in this. He delivered the homily. 
and he's the one who now also has given the families their mandate to go out. Absolutely. You know, we've been talking about how this world's meeting of families is set apart from the rest in a unique way. It was, you know, delayed by one year, limited to 2,000 families. It is more intimate, but I can't help but think the fact, I wonder how that feels to be one of the members here. To get a commission from Pope Francis, it probably feels all the more powerful, all the more intimate. I know that I was moved as a married woman, um, all his words that he had for married couples as well, and now they go from here to be missionaries from here. Well, you know, I, I've had somewhat of a similar experience as a missionary of mercy. You know, there's only a thousand priests in the world who are missionaries of mercy, and so we we had a very similar experience, and it does, it, it does endear you, uh, well, rather it endears the Holy Father to you, yeah. you know, to know that you were sort of selected to participate in what was, in fact, a limited event, you know, right. and that he expressed his closeness. Uh, now, he w it was easier for him to be closer to, say, a thousand priests than maybe 4,000, 5,000 people yeah. here at the Mass, but um, it does, I think, I think every family leaving the world meeting families will count themselves blessed and, and honored and lucky Absolutely. to have been here for this. Absolutely. But it's a very similar process in, in play here, uh, spiritually, and, and in some ways ecclesiastically or ecclesiologically, that you you were sent out That's right. to be missionaries of mercy. That's right, and he's sending them out to be missionaries in the world. Exactly, and, and it says, family missionary sending that right. we are missionaries now, we are evangelists in a culture. It's a great reminder, and again, this call to courage, I can't help but think how pertinent that will be for especially Catholic Americans who are here with the release, with the reversal of Roe v. Wade and the release of the Dobbs decision. A lot of us are going to have to have a lot of courage to be lights in the world and to speak truth boldly. Right. The Americans who are here are returning home, us included, yes. to a very changed world right. post-Roe. Yes. With everything that that entails. It's a, it's a journey for the country. It's a journey for Catholics. It's a journey for the pro-life cause. It's a journey for families now, too, yeah. to live that greater freedom, that hope with Roe overturned. Mm -hmm. But this is just the beginning of a journey. Absolutely. You know, and... Pope Francis used that word journey in his homily as well about how when you embrace your vocation, it is this exciting journey. And sure, there will be scary parts of it as well. But to take courage and again, to embrace your vocation. And we can do that, especially with this theme of family love, a vocation and a path to holiness. But that requires discernment as well for us to discern. Yeah, and that was one vocation. of the talks today by some Americans, right. Soren and Ever Johnson, about that process of discernment. And that that's one of those words that we, we talked about a few times over the last few days, but a lot of people don't necessarily understand what that is, and even experts don't always agree on what no, that and, would and, you know, the sermon's not a word we Dominicans generally use. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, I know that's, that's more of a, a, a Jesuit tradition, you yeah, know. An Ignatian. So, yeah, an Ignatian tradition. Right. But, I mean, he did speak a lot of trying to create a family in which there's enough silence and prayer in order to hear the voice yeah. of God. Right, well, and that, that's exactly it, to, to listen. And here we had Francis saying, open yourselves to Christ listen to him in the silence of prayer. It's, it's almost like it's lying straight out of the, the presentation that was given. But that idea then of listening to Christ, but then having the ability, the humility to listen to each other. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's been really a remarkable. The only other world meeting of families I've been to was back in 2015 and in Philadelphia. So to be here it had a very different tone. It was, um, as, as a Catholic, it's always an honor to be back in St. Peter's as well and the significance of this backdrop here. It's funny, when I was reflecting back on 2015, uh, you were there. Uh, the city was locked down pretty tight by security, which I thought was pretty interesting right. when, we go, when we look back at it understandable security concerns and everything, but the streets at times were very empty. Absolutely. Here we are yeah. in a situation that COVID has not passed. There's still a lot of COVID, but we're still seeing the effects of it. The yes. city here, the Eternal City, had been locked down. I was talking to somebody, what it was like to live here, where the streets were literally absolutely silent. But here we have signs of life and, and families leaving this mass, and you can hear the joy you can hear the laughter. The life fills the streets here. What an honor it has been to be a part of EWTN's continuous coverage of the 10th World Meeting of Families. And our coverage is not over yet. We'll be right back here in St. Peter's Square to cover the Angelus Prayer from Pope Francis. Make sure to tune in at 5.30 a.m. Eastern tomorrow. And if you've missed any portion of our programming, go over to EWTN's YouTube page. And with that, good night and God bless.